Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Good morning. Welcome to First Christian Church. So glad that you've decided to worship with us this morning. If you're a guest or visitor with us today, we're so glad you're with us. My name is Paul Carpenter. I'm the preaching pastor here, and on behalf of the church, we become one body under the name of Jesus Christ as we preach together, we commune together, and we sing together. Let's rise and give Jesus our voice as we sing. Please join us in singing number 25 in your hymnal, Praise to the Lord the Almighty. treasure. He is more worthy than diamonds or gold. The Lord is our life. In him we live and move and have our being. Let us pray. Holy God, you alone are worthy of our praise. As we, enter, as we enter into worship this morning, we offer you our hearts. 
Please fill us with your Holy Spirit so your, our worship will be a true sacrifice of praise. We ask this in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. of Christ. Good morning. Paul uh, asked me to address the congregation this morning and make a few announcements before we pray. There's uh, some specific things that are about to begin starting tomorrow. Finally, after all these years of putting out buckets and, and doing those kinds of things, beginning tomorrow, we will begin a re-roof of the flat portions of the main building here. It's been coming for a long time. The existing roof is is pushing, it's not quite 30, but it's going on 30 years old, so we've gotten a good life out of it, and we will be replacing the flat portion of the roof with new modified rubber beginning this coming Monday. Now this project, depending on weather, depending on, on it's, a, it's a sizable project, it's gonna take somewhere between 30 and 45 days to complete with the crew that we're using. We wanna let you know and make sure you probably saw, if those of you that are accustomed to parking on the 13th Street side, we went ahead and we, we have started blocking that off intentionally as spaces open up. You will not be able to park on the 13th Street side for the next month or so. So please be in the habit. We did block it off as we could this morning. Tomorrow, the rest of it will be completely blocked up. We'll be staging that job from the 13th Street side for the next, for the next few weeks. Also, beginning on a, a just, a, just a short time later, beginning on the 5th of March, the, um, the Great Hall and the West Door remodel project will find, this was a project that was approved by the board back in 2012 and we finally have the resources to get it done. And that project will begin on, on, on March the 5th. 
and that should take two to three weeks, we anticipate. So when you come in on Sunday, please forgive us if there's a little more dust out there than normal. If, there's, uh, if, if it's not exactly normal, just walk on through and pretend you didn't see it. But it's a, it'll be a work in progress, and we'll try to keep it pretty cleaned up for Sunday morning the best we can during construction. But any of you that have ever done any kind of this kind of work, you know what that's all about. So those two projects are about to kick off. Praise God, we've got the money and capital repair fund to do all of this. We're extremely happy about it, and uh, this has kind of been a goal to get that roof replaced. If, if you've been around in the spring after the winter freezes, Every single year, we have to ask, well, where's the new leaks going to come this year? And uh, it's just been a Band-Aid patch job for several years, and we're absolutely thankful and delighted that God has given us the resources to take on these projects at this time and get them done. Lord be with you. Let's pray. Good and gracious God, we come to you this morning during this season of Lent. We turn our eyes to the rising and the coming of Easter. Lord, help us to see this season as a time when we might cast away our struggles, our fears, our afflictions in hopes of receiving you more fully into our lives. Lord, we drift from time to time and we ask you to make this a time where you find, where we find our way back to you. Let us be true in the devotions we give you during this particular season. Today we raise the names of our friends, family, our neighbors that are struggling. We pray that they keep their trust in you strong. Remind them while you always remind us that it was never your promise to have a life without some grief, pain, or struggle. Your promise has always been that you will stand, us, stand with us when we hurt or when we break. Your promise is to heal our hearts. Bless those of, the people who are, those of our people who are ill, those listed in the bulletin today, and those whose conditions we may not even be aware of. Bless them with your healing, comforting presence, and love. We specifically remember the families of Jim Bales and Margaret Ingram, as they prepare for funerals in the coming week and weeks. Give strength to all of us who face difficult situations and let your compassionate light guide our decisions and steps along the way. Help us to fight the urges that threaten our own happiness, our health, and our relationships with you and with others. And Father, at this time we pray specifically for the contractors, the custodial staff, and all those involved in the repair and remodel projects we are about to undertake. Keep us safe from injuries and grant us the conditions needed to remain on schedule. Let us settle now, Lord, and feel your presence in this place. Help us to recognize our purpose. We pray that the church embraces its role as a life changer and a lifesaver to our community, particularly to those students that are that are so very close to us. Remind us that in your church, there is a home for each of us and a role for each of us to play. Help us to hear your calling in our lives. We come to you today in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs>
The church on earth lives by faith, not always by sight. The church in heaven lives by sight. Yesterday afternoon, we received news that one of our members, Margaret Ingram, had gone on to her heavenly reward in Jesus Christ, and that what we are practicing by faith, many times God rips through the fabric of reality and we can see Jesus. We can experience the Lord in a very real way. Margaret gets to experience that right now, all day, every day. And as we gather at this table, may we remember that our communion is both with Christ and with His church on earth, but it's also with the church in heaven. They're waiting for us every time we enter the sanctuary to break bread in Jesus' name. Let's remember our saints today as we share in the bread and cup. On the night Jesus gave himself for us, he took a loaf of bread, he blessed it, he broke it, and Jesus said, this is my body, which is given for you. Take and eat, all of you, and whenever you gather and eat from this bread, do so in remembrance of me. Let us pray. Loving Father, we come to your table this morning to celebrate with you and with the millions of followers that you have who come to praise your name this morning. As we enter this season of Lent, we look forward to celebrating the day that your son rises from the grave. But we also remember and give thanks for the day that you sacrificed your son on the cross that we might have forgiveness of sins. Now as we break this bread, representing Christ's broken body, we give thanks for that sacrifice and for the many blessings that you have given us. We ask as we leave this table this morning that we can lean on you to show us your way when sometimes we stubbornly try it our way. We pray always in your Son's holy name. Amen. Amen. Similarly, after the meal, Jesus took and poured a cup of wine. He gave thanks for the cup as well, which was the cup of his suffering. And then he told his disciples that this cup has become a new covenant that we have with God. And it is filled with his covenantal blood, which will be shed on the cross for the forgiveness of sins for many people. He told them to drink of it. And that every time that they gathered and they drank again, to do so in remembrance of him. Let us pray. Gracious God, our Father, as we continue our prayer this morning, and especially on this first Sunday of Lent, we want to remember the sacrifice of your Son on the cross. For we know that through this sacrifice, we have been given hope of eternal life and forgiveness of our sins. We give thanks for the cup and its meaning as we share it together each Sunday. Make us penitent for so many of our thoughts and actions. Open our hearts to your Holy Spirit. Guide us in a way that lets us become closer to you. And we would ask these things in your Son's holy and precious name. Amen. Amen.
Please join me in reciting the words from John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. As the choir moves to the chancel to proclaim the power of the cross of Jesus Christ, you're invited to participate in a time of generosity through tithes and offerings to thank God and to obey Him with delight for all that He's done in your life.
with the same spirit that just sang through the choir, Father, we pray that these gifts would be used to lift high the cross, the mercy, the gospel of Jesus Christ, but to also lift high the truth that he's no longer on the cross, but is resurrected, sits on high, and has sent out his Holy Spirit into the world. May these gifts be a lifting up of your Son and a magnification of his name through this city and beyond. Father, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. The children are invited forward. Good morning, guys. So our word, of the, our word of the month is kindness. And today we're learning about how to be kind and have God help us be kind to people who are outsiders. So sometimes when someone's new, they don't always feel like they belong. And so they may feel like an outsider. So we're going to pray and learn all about how to make them feel like they belong and share Jesus with them. Okay. So Lena, can you tell us what our scripture is? Do to others as you want them to do to you. Luke, Scripture 31. Good job. And Christian's going to pray for us. Dear God, please help us have a good day and lift up our hearts to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please rise for the gospel reading. The scripture reading this morning comes from John 14, 15 through 19. Here begins the reading. If you love me, keep my commands, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me because I live. You also will live. The word of the Lord. Let us pray. Father, we pray you take full advantage of this moment by the power of the blood of Christ, by the Holy Spirit which is promised, and the truth that you said, not maybe, but for sure, that you would have people who worship you in spirit and in truth. And what the Lord wants, the Lord gets. Father, may you get what you paid for today. May we behold your Son. May we have strong and growing affections for him. And may that fling us into your glory and into your care. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning is John 14. And there's a famous passage that Jesus invokes. He says, if you love me, you will obey me. If you love me, you will obey me. Now, as you... We'll, we'll get to that in a minute, but that's, that's how I feel about this scripture. I, I'll cue you up, I'll cue you up. They ruined my surprise. 
If you love me, you will obey me. Now there's, as you leave, when, the, when the, the starting gun sounds and you start on this race of reading the scripture, you can immediately choose one of two paths. And one thing you can say is, in order to, jo- in order to prove that I love Jesus, I will obey him. In order to prove to myself that I have an authentic faith, I will obey him. I'm going to be arguing this morning that the actual intent of the scripture is the opposite, which is to say, because I love him, my duty is now my privilege and my pleasure. I want to obey him. And when I'm taken up in the Holy Spirit, when my affections are filled for Jesus and I'm stirred inside and I have the butterflies for Jesus and not for some boy at high school or some girl at school or some car I want to buy or a new job, when I'm affectionate for Jesus, my, what I want to do in that moment is good. I should trust it. I should do it. Jesus says, if you love me, you'll obey me. And you can read it from the law perspective, which says, I have to obey Jesus in order to prove that I love him. Or you can read it from the gospel perspective that says, because I'm in love with Jesus, what I naturally want to do when I'm in Jesus is obey, obedient to him. See the difference? Are we, are we good? That's important. It looks like semantics, but it's critical. It's similar to this. Uh, I married Valerie. I married way up. My grandfather told me that he always respects a man that marries above his station. And so he was grateful for that too. Um, if you ask me how our marriage is going, I could answer that in one of two ways. I could do it from the legal perspective and say, well, I mean, you know, I stood in front of God and people and I made some vows and I'm going to stick to them. I, 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 I'm a man of my word and, and, and uh, I, I promise to do something and I'm going to do it. And, and a good marriage includes doing these things, so I'm going to do these things. Or I could say, she's my little everything. And my favorite thing to do is to lay down every night and watch one Netflix show with her in bed, and then cuddle and fall asleep. That's my favorite thing all day. The holiest moment, I woke up last, I didn't really fall asleep, I I may look tired because I was up all night in prayer. Laying next to my wife as she sleeps in peace is joyful to me. Amen? Amen, yeah, you can get for it, yeah. Now, so, you know, you can say, law or gospel, I'm obeying because I have to or I'm obeying because I want to. This is an issue that Jesus is pointing out. One other preacher says this is a root and fruit situation. If your root is an affection for Jesus, the fruit will be obedience. Not because you have to, but because you desire to. Well, this morning, we're continuing our series about beholding Jesus throughout this season of Lent about looking at the face of Jesus. And there's plenty of songs that you can go home and Spotify or YouTube and listen to. Uh, Some oldies and goodies are Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. Right? My Jesus, I love thee. Tons of Jesus songs. Fill your heart with Jesus songs this Lent because it's all about beholding Christ. I told some of you at the beginning of the season on Wednesday at Ash Wednesday service, uh, and great turnout, by the way. Thank you for attending that that this season, I feel like Jesus is saying, hey, I'm not on the cross anymore. I've been raised from the dead. I have ascended. My Holy Spirit has come. So when you travel through Lent, let me hold your hand and smile as I show you everything I did for you. Let's do Lent with Jesus. And so as the series progresses, we're talking about the importance of looking at Jesus so we start to look like Jesus, that the world needs a church that doesn't have all the right answers, a church that votes the right, we don't need a church that's perfect. Instead, we need a church that looks like Jesus because we've been looking at Jesus. We need to be generous and beautiful and kind and compassionate and firm on the word of God, but all because we've spent considerable moments gazing upon the holiness of Jesus. So these next three weeks, including today, are going to be about the phases of life when you're beholding Jesus, the stations you'll find yourself in. And you'll always be in one of three, 
And the Holy Spirit is who enables you to get to where you need to be at any given moment. And the one we're on today is my favorite because it's, it's looking at Jesus and wanting Jesus into being the best spot you've been all year with butterflies in your stomach and your affections are burning for Jesus and your obedience for him is also what you want to do. If we could never leave there, that would be awesome. This is what heaven looks like. Where your flesh has no say, your spirit is in control, and you're connected with Jesus. Now next week we're going to be talking about what do I do when I don't feel like obeying him? And you may be sitting here right now listening to the sermon thinking, this ain't for me, I don't feel good, I don't want to, I'm in a bad place. And next week we're going to talk about the importance of getting in the word of God, igniting the power of the word of the Lord to actually sling you up and fling you up into the promises of God. So we're going to go from affections to simply walking through the word. And then the third week we're going to focus on what it means to repent and start over. Every one of these movements is by the power of the Holy Spirit. And they're not supposed to be clunky. They're supposed to be continual. That you have affections for Jesus, you stay in the word, you repent every day. You're affection for Jesus, you stay in the word, you repent every day, and you start spiraling upward in holiness and connections to Jesus. But we'll start with the best today. If you love me, you'll obey me. He goes on later in verse 19 and says, before long, the world won't see me any, anymore, but you will behold me still. And it's by beholding me that you will love me. There's two main things I'd like to point out this morning about being affectionate for Jesus, about being stirred for Jesus. And the first one is that God is going to be most brilliant and strong and sovereign in your life when you are most satisfied in Him. God is going to be, as another preacher puts it, most glorified in you when you're most satisfied in Him. And people want to go swing for the fences and say, what do I need to do to make my life count, to be part of the ministry of the church, to be included in God's work for His kingdom? And it all starts with the beginning to say, if you're not satisfied with God, He's not glorified in you. If, if you're still looking outside of God for something to bring you that satisfaction, you're going to come up empty. We had a rough week as a country, but it uh, turns out to be a pretty frequent encounter where we have somebody walking into a place of learning with a gun and killing people. Our country is a story, it's a parable. In the history of the human race, there has never been a more prosperous, resource-available people than the United States of America. Even when we live, we live on this side of the invention of the integrated circuit, 1952, by Jack Kilby. He invented this little circuit that created this exponential growth so that we had televisions and then computers, and then now we all carry a computer. You have a computer in your pocket right now. I hope it's silenced, by the way. You've got a computer in your pocket. You have the ability to be satisfied with anything you want, sensory-wise, food-wise, faster than ever, and you're living in a country who still argues about who has rights and who doesn't, go back 100 years or go to an underdeveloped country and that won't be an argument anymore. Every American is booming with connections to stuff all day. And so what does that do to us? Does that make us utterly satisfied? 
No. It makes us despair. Because we know, as the rich man knows, that unless you have Jesus, you've tasted everything on earth and you feel incomplete. That, that feeling takes away hope that there's still something out there for you to make you feel better. There's a study that I, I saw recently about uh, suicide, and I don't want to get too deep into these, these things, but <clears throat> suicide has been coined the luxury of the wealthy, taking place twice as often in white, middle-class people than in people of color. And you go to underdeveloped countries like Syria, where there's a war on right now, it's almost unheard of to have suicide. Suicide is an act of despair. To say, I've tasted everything under the sun. It's Ecclesiastes style. I've tasted everything under the sun. You know what it tastes like? Nothing. I've watched every Netflix show. I've, I've, I've gone to Disney World. I've, in, I've done everything in my life. And you know what it leaves me feeling? Dissatisfied. God alone will satisfy your heart. God alone will satisfy. That's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. Smile, right? God alone will satisfy your heart, and God has freely given his love to you. He loves you so much that he's willing to intervene in your life and break through your distractions and your deafness to say, I am here all the time. Behold my glory and burn, burn inside by joyously looking at my beauty. God is most glorified in you when you are most satisfied in him. Praise the Lord. We're the only religion that teaches this. Others say Allah is most glorified when you're most submissive. Our God says the Father is most glorified when you're most satisfied. So eat and drink of the Lord. His Spirit inside the church, inside every believer right now wants that for you more than you want that for you. And perhaps this morning, this sermon is stirring up inside of you an affection for Jesus to gaze on his glory and to look at him with passion. This type of obedience is the best type of obedience. This type of marriage is the best type of marriage, not one out of obligation, but one out of affection. I get to, not I have to. Number two, Jesus says a lot of things in John, John 14 through 17, about how hard the world will be. I encourage you to go read them. The world will hate you, but don't worry, they hated me first. I've joked that Jesus would say, the world doesn't like your Facebook post, don't worry, they didn't like mine first. It's a rough world, isn't it? This type of obedience through satisfaction in who Jesus is is a transcendent obedience that overcomes any condition around you. Simple, simple, flesh-based, popular Oprah Winfrey obedience says, I'll only obey where the conditions are favorable, but God Obedience through the Holy Spirit says, I will obey above every single condition because he died for me unconditionally. He didn't wait until I was perfect before he died for me. He didn't wait till I attended church enough before he put his spirit in me. He didn't wait until I memorized the Bible before he showed his glory to me. And so the least I could do is praise him and obey him even when I hurt. Even when there has been a shooting. And folks, you're attending a protest right now. We protest not for the left or the right. We protest for the kingdom of God who will come with power with Jesus Christ himself 
returns. People have asked me, Paul, are you a Republican or are you a Democrat? And I tell them, no, I believe in a monarchy ruled by a royal family, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I don't want to see some nation try to pull that off. We see how that turns out in Africa. We want God to return with His Son. In the meantime, we'll accept the democracy and we will pray for our leaders, but we need Jesus Christ to return because He alone is going to produce a righteous place, a righteous a righteous kingdom. Until that comes, Jesus has given us the ability to be an unconditional people because he's an unconditional God. Whatever you're facing right now, whatever, a son with cancer, a church that just lost one of our dear members, two of our dear members, Jim and Margaret, if you're trying to figure out where you're going in life, if you've got a friend named Kay that's hurting in the hospital, you want to know how to help her best. Wherever you're facing in life, Jesus Christ has given you by his providential love a, an imperfect, messy, unique-to-you scenario so that you can praise him and glorify him in the ups and in the downs. And there's a clip from a movie we're going to queue up here. I'm going to give you a little warning about a man who has been messed with. He's gone through every negative scenario you can think of in a given day, including wrecking his car, getting punched in the face, having his main enemy, a, a, a rival business, attack his business and take over his business when the man we'll be looking at is a man who loves the poor and this other guy hates the poor and his marriage is falling apart, his kids are sick, his house is drafty, it's just a really rough day. You are going to see a video of a man who is simultaneously experiencing the worst day of his life with praise in his heart for Jesus. The conditions will never be perfect. But Jesus will always be perfect. And you have the opportunity this moment. We're going to take a moment of silence and to pray. And I'm going to encourage you as your pastor. And you, may, you may be sitting here thinking, I'm not feeling, I'm not, this is not my day. Hey, that's okay. I understand that. We'll talk about it the next week. But if you are filled with affections for Jesus, if you're so grateful for who he is and grateful that he's given you a life an imperfect life that you can walk with faith through. If that's where you are, I want you to sit with that affection as we pray. We're going to have our closing hymn, and then I want to encourage you to just do whatever your spirit is telling you to do. And that may mean go on with your day, go to Sunday school. I'm teaching chalice class next, way, next across the way. That's great. It may be you need to go home right now and make that phone call. It may need, I don't know what you're supposed to do. Only Jesus knows what you're supposed to do. But if you're enamored with the glory of Jesus and how beautiful he is, don't hesitate to do what he's putting on your heart to do. Because Jesus says, when you're loving me, you're obeying me. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Christ Jesus, who took the cross and gave us the Spirit, gave us a relationship with you, 
we ask you, Father, that your spirit would move into the church and shake and ignite the spirit of God inside every believer. We pray, Lord, that the affections for your son Jesus would reign through us. And whatever our day looks like conditionally, may your praise and your perfection be what leads us. May we have the joy and the peace that surpasses all understanding. And may you get from your church this day walking, talking praise, not just in the sanctuary, but seven days a week. We pray this, Father, all through the mighty mercy and power of the name of Jesus. Amen. As we stand to sing our closing hymn, this may be your day that you decide to join First Christian Church or you've decided to openly profess Christ as your Lord and Savior for the first time. We encourage you to come forward and receive the right hand of Christian fellowship as we sing our closing hymn. Well, we have good news. We welcome in Jen Townsley. Jen, you can come over here. You can be seen on the video. Jen's been in our choir for a year and a half, two years? A year and a half. year and a half, and God has done incredible things in her heart. She would love to tell you her story, but she told me she doesn't want to tell it right now in front of everyone. <laughs> We're going to ask her the question that everyone has asked in order to join the Church of Jesus Christ. Jen, do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and you profess him as Lord and Savior. Yes. Praise God. Praise God. Church, would you join me in welcoming Jen?
And also, Jen, we've got a commitment to make through you or to you. Please join me, friends. Reaffirming our own faith in Jesus the Christ, we gladly welcome you into this community of faith, enfolding you with our love and committing ourselves to your care. In the power of God's Spirit, let us mutually encourage each other to trust God and strengthen one another to serve others that Christ's church may in all things stand faithful. God bless you. Jim is going to walk you back, and the choir is going to have to go without one of their singers for a moment. Yeah, amen. Let's clap it up. Praise God. Jen has one of those great stories of uh, entering the church through our music ministry and being affected by you all and by the power of the Spirit. And uh, her story is really pretty amazing uh, to hear. So take a chance to get to know Jen. Also, on your way out, there's a few things to pick up, including uh, devotionals for Lent. These are family-oriented, but they're for all ages as well. If you've got little kids, we encourage you to include them in on that. Uh, we also have something called crosswords, which are in little colored squares, pieces of paper. They are, uh, there are 480 words, I believe, and only two per word. So yours is very unique to you. We encourage you to pick one up without fishing through. Do not pick one you want. Pick one God wants for you. And again, as your pastor, I'm encouraging you to spend this moment after the benediction to follow the lead of the Holy Spirit within your heart. Join me now for our benediction. And now may the Lord bless you. May he keep you. May the Lord be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his holy countenance and give you the passion and ability to see his glory and grant you the peace of his Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.